I think I'll start with the um, welcoming people here. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair this meeting today with Andrew and Rowan. Uh, we will be using the uh, webinar sort of style of Zoom meeting, so you'll be able to um, put your questions in the chat or preferably in the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, the way this will work is uh, we will have the speakers, Rowan and Andrew, talk, and then questions will be answered at the end. So without further ado, I think we will begin. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I farm on, which is Wiradjuri, Wiradjuri land, and the Farmers for Climate Action acknowledges the traditional owners of the land on which we work and the traditional owners of the land of our guests and speakers and where they're coming from. And we pay respects to, to their elders past, present and emerging. So thank you for that. Um, now, I think the next thing to do is to make sure that it's all working nicely. And we will introduce our speakers now. Our first speaker today is Andrew Ward. He's the Director of Regen Farmers Mutual. He's also CEO of Ethical Fields, a consultancy specialising in community ownership. He's Treasurer of the New Economy Network of Australia and a Director of Incubator Co-op and Henhouse Co-op. Uh, and with Rowan Clark, he, Rowan is also a director of Regen Farmers Mutual. He's also a conservation advisor to Trust for Nature, treasurer of Incubator Co-op, and a director of regenerative, regenerative tourism platform, Wayfarer Co-op. So thank you, Rowan and Andrew, for coming along. I think it's gonna be a very interesting um, discussion on uh, cooperative carbon markets. Uh, it's a very interesting area of conversation for many of our farmers. There's a great many farmers out there wanting to work out how they can do this, but there's a great many pitfalls in it. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Andrew to kick us off and um, run us through what he knows about the carbon market. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having us. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge I'm on Awakabal, Awabakal country uh, on the central coast of New South Wales, between Sydney and Newcastle. Not close enough to Newcastle to avoid the lockdown, but not close enough to Sydney to get a vote in their elections either. Um, look, I'm so excited on behalf of Rowan and, and myself uh, to be presenting this uh, slide deck to you guys as the first set of farmers to have seen this slide deck, we are making you guinea pigs in some way, but we're really excited um, about the potential of uh, speaking with Farmers for Climate Action. And partly the reason is, is because uh, we're under the belief that farmers in Farmers for Climate Action understand that they're uniquely capable and positioned to deal with the twin challenges of catastrophic biodiversity loss and climate change, temperature rises as a result of greenhouse gases. And the reason farmers are uniquely capable of addressing uh, those two twin challenges is because farmers are the only ones that can be regenerative and create a true profit. And by a true profit, I mean an ecological profit and an economic profit. Now we understand an economic profit to be, you know, a surplus after a time period and capital at hand increasing. And it's no mystery what an ecological profit is either. It's increased biodiversity and increased organic matter and increased ground cover and increased water holding capacity. And it comes in the form of land that's in better shape. So farmers, I think, have the ability uniquely amongst all professions across the world to address both biodiversity loss and climate change through regenerative practices. And when they do, they create these things called environmental goods and services. Now, a lot of people use the acronym EGNS, and I'm gonna put them into some buckets for you so that you've got 
you know, a bit of an idea about how these buckets function. There's a environmental goods and services around pollution, and that's particularly concerned with water pollution and air pollution. When we're talking about water pollution, it's not just chemical runoff or nutrient runoff, it's also siltation and sedimentation and um, water quality overall. We're talking about EGNS, that can be in relation to a specific species or habitat. We've seen things done for tigers and rhinos and koalas and certain habitats. Now, carbon, everybody has probably heard of carbon and carbon these days comes as an environmental goods and services with co-benefits, social ones, cultural ones, and biodiversity uh, can be both a co-benefit to carbon and potentially, uh, and in an, in an emerging sense, uh, a standalone unit of environmental goods and services that can be transacted. Now, the interesting thing about these environmental goods and services is that we're right at the beginning of a growth curve. And, and we know we're at the beginning of that growth curve because you know, less than two years ago, there were no corporations who were um, signed up to a net zero by 2030, let alone 2050 policy. And today there's two and a half thousand of those corporations. And we know that they're gonna demand environmental goods and services to what the CSIRO projects will be $48 billion of value by 2050. Now to put $48 billion into sort of um, context for you, that's the same as the all the meats, uh, your tropical fruits, wheat and cotton times two. So imagine a new industry with the impact of wheat and cotton and all meats and tropical fruits, doubling its size and entering into the agricultural space. That's what is the size of opportunity that's coming in the form of environmental goods and services that's looking for a home to place uh, incentives and assets at the disposal of farmers who are building a true profit. So we also want to do this right, because if we do the sort of top-down approach the, where the governments advise bureaucrats who use policy wonks to engage scientists to create methods that then the corporations adopt and tell us, you know, if we comply with this regime, this method, we've sequestered or offset X amount of carbon, then we've done a good thing and you can all be given a prescribed outcome, a, a possible benefit. We know when we do top down, just like a, a, a fish rots from the head, uh, it always 100% of the time has unintended outcomes. And we've done top down markets to our water market and the Murray Darling um, water market is dysfunctional. And personally, and I hope farmers for climate action share this, I don't think we can afford to risk that dysfunction in biodiversity, in carbon, in our habitats for our native species. Now, there's a lot of things given the, the size of this emerging market and the diversity and the relative lack of knowledge about this market and that there are barriers and that there are risks to farmers. And some of the biggest barriers are just mindset, that paddock between our ears. So for most of us, as we identify as farmers, it's as a beef farmer or a wheat farmer or a cotton farmer, or it's not as an environmental goods or services farmer. In fact, that lexicon doesn't exist. And we know that when you've got these top-down markets, they work in methods and raise genes and testing protocols and that becomes very complex and they use language which is very detached from the day-to-day -day production and day-to-day -day activities of what farmers do and then of course there's brokers uh, who are in it to to intermediate between the supply side and the demand side and they've actually got a disincentive to putting money into the farmers pockets because that's money that otherwise could go into their pocket. Now, the other thing is that we have, unfortunately, but this has been borne out in a lot of the co-design, you know, we have a problem where when governments or conservation agencies have 
an incentive or a capital placement regime uh, that tries to engage with farmers, it's met with resistance, active resistance by farmers. Farmers don't want to hear from the government or conservation agencies about how to farm because they feel that governments and conservation agencies are only interested in locking up their farms, not letting them be proactive managers, miring them in red tape. But if we're going to have farmers participate in this massive market, new skill sets must emerge and new methods by which farmers collaborate must happen. So let's talk about those new skill sets. I believe the key skill set will be a thing we call landscape agronomy. And just like with traditional agronomy, you need to get agronomic fit and you need to be able to compare the gross margin of different enterprises by using the resources that you've got on hand and that you project you'll have on hand. But you'll also need an advisor and skill set uh, as a farmer that understands regenerative practices and ecology and technology and the markets that you're selling into and the levers that are at your disposal as a farmer. And they might help you put in a, uh, an EGNS opportunity on your farm. And one of the clearest ones of those is an EGNS backed loan. And that's where a, a lending organisation will provide to a farmer uh, the capital costs of say building a riparian zone around a water, a, a, a dam, which creates a biodiverse habitat, which provides, you know, water security during droughts and mental health security and a whole host of benefits. But that that loan will be provided on no interest or low interest terms because it's backed by the environmental goods and services that are then produced. And you could see that would be appealing to organic farmers who are, you know, already required to be organic farmers to put 5% of their land into uh, conservation. And it will be important to a lot of farmers about what they can do on their farm. But I want to talk to you about what farmers can do at a farm group scale between 12 to 50 farmers, often more, you get landscape scale impact. And when you have landscape scale impacts, you have the opportunities for farmers to um, shift the needle beyond what a single farmer can do. It really is a case of one plus one equal, equaling three. And I wanna kind of explain this through uh, a transaction that we're helping to facilitate, which is working with three groups of farmers in a singular catchment following the Bellinger River. So at the top of the river in the rural landscapes, in the top of the catchment, you can see farmers moving from set stocking to time controlled grazing. And as they're doing that, they're increasing the amount of soil carbon, which increases the amount of water holding capacity. And in high rainfall events, reduces the amount of water moving into the catchment. Now, working with the group of farmers further downstream in Bellingen, uh, where a lot of land and a lot of, of the, uh, the river has been cleared of its riparian zone, there is the opportunity to revegetate and create new bio, uh, biodiversity and habitats there. But the happy consequence is you also, in high rainfall events, slow down the flow of water. So that by the time that it's reached the coastal plains, it has time to work with the salt marshes and the wetlands and the man-made levees and other things that are there to prevent infrastructure. But bearing in mind that those coastal farmers also have uh, inundation and rising sea levels pushing changes to the ecology in their farm groups. But we know if we can get the rural riparian and coastal zones and the farmers along those zones working to change their land practices in coordination, you start to produce a carbon plus revegetation biodiversity plus flood mitigation product that's of a scale that the likes of NAB and um, the likes of the RTA and the local hospital who bear the impacts of flooding are likely to be uh, welcome buyers of those sorts of carbon plus biodiversity plus flood mitigation products. 
And then what you can see is it becomes a, a circular economy, which changes the whole hydrology and, and ecosystem function of that Bellinger River. And what's most exciting or what is particularly exciting about this is that farmers all up the East Coast escarpment from following the Great Dividing Range could participate in a similar sort of transaction as it comes to market, making, you know, a big impact on biodiversity, habitat, on climate change. So at this point, I'm going to ask Peter, could you just drop into the chat the link that is seen on screen, this Regen Farmers Mutual link. And I'm just going to take us over to uh, this map here. So what you're looking at, at on screen is a map of, of uh, the Regen Farmers Mutual. And what we've done is we've mapped the Regen Farmers Mutual to the NRM regions. So uh, when I put in a postcode, it takes me to an NRM region. Uh, so that could be in Mariba for the Northern Gulf, but if I was in Cairns, it'd probably be the F, uh, FNQ uh, group. Now, what's interesting about the, uh, the, the NRM regions and the way that that interacts with the farmers who are in the Regen Farmers Mutual and aggregated together to do a transaction is we can start to align the federal money that comes into the NRM regions landscape plan with the private market money that comes in from corporations and institutions to pay farmers for the land practices that are relevant to their ecosystem and their context to make landscape scale impacts that genuinely affect our ability to mitigate the twin challenges of biodiversity loss and climate change. So at this point, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Rowan Clark. You probably gathered I come from the agricultural and regen side of things. And I'm very fortunate over the last four or five years that uh, Rowan and I've been working together in Incubator Co-op to meet Rowan who, uh, as he might explain later when he introduces himself, brings a completely different perspective, a market's perspective, an investment banker's expect, uh, perspective to this. But he's come at this through, I guess, a, a reformed investment banker experience and can help farmers and the Regen Farmers Mutual to avoid the dysfunctional markets like we've seen in water be applied to our other environmental goods and services. So at this point, I'm gonna get you, uh, Rowan, uh, to take over. Thanks, Wardy, that's very good. Um, one of the downsides of being a reformed investment banker is you have to put up with my less than uh, dynamic uh, presentation skills that Wardy has. <laughs> so on the, uh, the, the dry um, uh, presenter. So let me just go to the uh, slides. What we thought we'd do is like, so as Wardy said, my background um, is originally investment banking. So I had 20 odd years, um, started out in currency markets and then uh, worked in commodity markets, you know, set up a commodities desk for a German bank with desks in London and Sydney. And then, yeah. You know, anyway, I left that industry about 10 years ago, but, um, and then I've been working in conservation finance over the last uh, three or four years. And in, that, in the conservation uh, uh, finance site, uh, markets, you can kind of see the emergence of a, of a market that we're very much in a, an immature state. And so when we look to the environmental markets, you can kind of see that they were um, round about where the, uh, the commodities markets were back in the early 90s. So they're um, the, in the carbon market very much, and, and the biodiversity market very much dominated by government. The, the markets are highly illiquid and bespoke. And the market structure is one that like um, promotes uh, opacity. So it's, it's the opposite of what we need for an efficient market. And because of that, it leads to very high transaction costs and the, and the role of brokers, the role that brokers play uh, becomes as, interme as intermediaries becomes path critical. And it's in their interest under this current market structure to promote, to continue to promote opacity because as a former broker myself, I know the way that I, you know, a broker maximizes their margins 
is through keeping both sides of the transaction happy because they're, 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 they're negotiating a transaction between buyer and seller. And the way you keep both sides happy is by, by, by so like avoiding transparency so you can maximize your margin at the same time. And so what this, what this market structure does, it, it, it prevents the kind of delivery of, of, um, of impact at scale through the environmental markets. And this is a global problem, by the way. So, and it's uh, across the globe carbon markets. If you look at them, we had, we had the, the beginnings of standardized transactions back in 2006. You know, uh, there was a, 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 a I mean, contract that was brought out that was like, this is our standardized contract. And you can see that we've like carbon markets have, have moved away from that because of this broker market being um, motivated to do so. And so, um, but having said that, we've got um, so many factors driving towards, um, you know, recognizing the need that we, you know, we need to solve like uh, for a more efficient uh, environmental markets and governments are really cognizant of this and we can see that both at the Commonwealth and the, at, the, um, at the state level. And so we're talking here, you know, it's not just carbon. So carbon markets, you know, clearly have been, you know, um, you've got the emissions reduction fund that's been now in play for, for um, you know, 10 odd, odd years. But um, at the state level, you can see that the, the um, state governments are bringing in things like the land restoration fund, there's carbon plus, you know, co-benefits. Bush Bank in Victoria is due to be released in the second half of the year, which will be about carbon plus bio, uh, bio, biodiversity. So very much looking at um, um, uh, landscape impacts beyond carbon. Similarly, the WA program in, in, uh, that was announced uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks um, focuses on the same thing. And Biodiversity Conservation Trust is a very is, is basically the best funded kind of institution uh, in across all the states, and that has has been actively um, Kind of promoting the idea of markets beyond carbon. So what you're seeing is that there's the, the, both the federal level where the objective is to drive down transaction costs, which are currently prohibitively high in terms of the, the carbon markets. So they're very interested in kind of finding ways to drive, drive down the cost of, for example, measuring soil carbon down to $2.50 a tonne, as opposed to wherever it stands at the moment, like $20 or $30, depending on who you talk to. They're also kind of, in, you know, that, that announced that investment of $4 million in a carbon trading platform. The thing with that is the governments are good at handing out money, but they're not good at catalyzing markets. And so that's, that's, a, that's a challenge that we have to, we have to, to cross. That 96% of all carbon bought in Australia is, is bought by, through the ERF. And so that's not, um, you know, enabling us to catalyze, um, um, you know, the emergence of, of efficient markets. So what we need to do is to, to, to build voluntary markets. And so that, um, what we are seeing is globally, there is a, 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 like a surge of demand from the corporate sector. Um, and you know, um, whether it's a net uh, 2050 or, or net zero 2030 is your target. Globally, that uh, uh, corporates are embracing the need to look at, um, at ways of uh, reducing their carbon uh, um, imprint uh, off their, uh, impact and also more and more looking beyond carbon. And so while, while there's regulatory requirements, um, for example, if you're a property developer or you're building a mine, a gold mine in New South Wales, you need to go and get your biodiversity offset. The voluntary, voluntary markets in Australia are emerging. So I was part of a, um, the Biodiversity Markets Working Group, um, which started up at the beginning of last year. We've got the Nature Conservancy, 10 Deserts Projects, I, ILSC, various other large organizations on, um, together. And we were looking at how, how the markets could be expanded beyond carbon. So we went through a process of interviewing 50 odd corporates and, and governments um, over a, you know, a two month period to try and identify where, where they are at with respect to, to, to markets. And the, the, the clear theme that emerged from, that, from, those, from those conversations were one, that, they, um, that carbon had become a, you know, like a, you know, it's embedded in a lot of the very large corporates kind of DNA now. Um, but beyond that, like someone like, for example, Athiona, which is, you know, um, the world's largest um, uh, engineering Spanish outfit that like engineering company in the, in the green um, uh, uh, engineering space, they, uh, you know, they have uh, net zero carbon, but they've also got water biodiversity and they've got, they've got targets with respect to those too. So they're very much interested in looking at, you know, measures beyond that. And that was kind of echoed across that corporate sphere that like they were, you know, corporates are looking for more than just simply a carbon offset. They're looking for ultimately a social license. 
And so what, what this is like ultimately lead, leading to is that the, the corporate demand is likely to, you know, the expectation is that demand for carbon, particularly in Australia, is going to outstrip supply. And so that represents an opportunity for farmers clearly. And that and that the risk is that, the, 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 or the, the tension for these buyers is that it comes, the, the cost of carbon comes from their margins. So this is clearly going to be an inflationary, uh, the whole ESG kind of uh, wave is going to be inflationary for the globe. But like it's going to push up um, co the cost base for corporates. So there's a natural tension between how much they're prepared to pay for, for carbon and other and co-benefits um, versus um, the social license they acquire. So like when, when in talking to large corporates, they often look at, um, they just don't do one transaction. They just don't buy like a, a lump of carbon from one, um, from one developer or one project. What they tend to do is to build a portfolio um, so that they might buy a little bit of carbon from Australia and then pair that with some cheaper carbon from India, from a hydro dam in the, India. And in that way, deliver the, 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 the carbon offset, but also acquire the social license at the same time. So, um, so one of the, the clearest things that, that came out of that process that we went through with the Biodiversity Markets Working Group though, was that like uh, the corporates are also motivated to drive efficiencies in this market. So we've got the sell side who are interested in efficiencies. We've got the government who's interested in the more efficient market. And if you think about farmers, we're, all, you know, we're also interested in driving more, you know, more efficient market. The current market structure though is the brokers in between aren't. <laughs> and so, so we've, got, um, we've got a need to, to drive towards a common language towards standardization to make pricing more transparent in both the carbon and, um, and other markets. So where's, where, where is that going? So there's um, out of that biodiversity markets working group, for example, um, that came this idea of a marketplace for nature. And this is being developed uh, uh, under the Pollination Foundation's umbrella at the moment, still with those same you know, organisations involved. But this was really, if you think about it, um, the idea of creating a market where it's, it's a watering hole, where buyers and sellers can come together and try and, try and define a common language so that so we can start creating transparency about you know the types of transactions that are emerging so you know from the supply side and also from a buy side you could get a sense of well this is the type of carbon or this is the type of buy, um, offset that i'm looking for as a buyer so the, the emergence of, of uh, platforms and, and ways that the, that the buyers and sellers can can better communicate is likely to be um, you know a, a feature of the market going forward and similarly, that we, as uh, Wardy and I have got a deeper understanding of where the markets are evolving to, we've got a better sense from, particularly from an agricultural perspective, but from a commodity sector as a whole, um, got a deeper sense that the, the terminal markets, where, where the products ultimately sold, they're also going to be um, highly responsive to green provenance. And so this is the idea, there's a difference between green, green LNG and brown LNG, or between um, a sim simpler version between your battery laid uh, hen laid eggs and your free range egg la laid eggs. There's a price differential because you know consumers want to support the free range eggs. I believe in in terms of you know both the uh, the animal welfare and also the, the product. And so another key driver of these markets ultimately will be the terminal markets for agricultural produce. And that we can see that, that, that as, as we've worked through this, that we're starting to get a line of sight how environmental markets can inform these, you know, the, the, these, the green provenance in the terminal markets. Um, one of the things that becomes really clear, so we've been talking about you know, how the markets are evolving and talking about the role of brokers that sit uh, between buyers and sellers. Um, and, and brokers can be of different varieties. They can be brokers that act more for, for sellers or they can be brokers that like act more for buyers. You know, you can think of it like in a real estate term, you could be a buyer's advocate versus a, you know, um, you know your, your auction, uh, auctioneer. And so, um, so someone like uh, Point Advisory, who is very much a corporate advisor, is right up there like helping their buyers access, um, access markets. Most brokers will gravitate to the buy side because that's where the money is. That's who's paying the bills. Um, Wardy and I have been working on this region, Farmers Mutual, through this co-design process because we've come to understand that by, by bringing farmers together to own their own broker, you, this is the cl cleanest expression of farmers 
acting for themselves. It's, there's, there's, there can be entities here that can act, be very close to and act for sellers, but um, this Regen Farmers Mutual, because it'll be farmer owned and because it's baked into its DNA that like the principles of the, of the mutual are very much driven by, you know, farmers have primacy of, and, and over the data, for example, with respect to the mutual, that the mutual only deal, you know, promotes local interactions, what have you. So we've got this set of principles that have come out of the co-design process that reflect the fact that this entity is farmer owned. And so in the sense this, by, by doing so, uh, we've cre you can create an entity that effectively aggregates um, uh, the negotiating power of farmers. So you can think of it as just like one big institutional entity that acts for farmers that can now negotiate with a stronger voice with the buy side. And that's what the, the mutual effectively is. Um, so so what, this, what this can do is it can, just, it can disrupt this broker market dynamic. And it doesn't have to remove, you know, there's, there's, there's a reason why brokers, you know, brokers will continue to exist. But what mutuals and cooperatives tend to do is they tend to be called pacemakers. They tend to, 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 to create a, a new market dynamic. And this has happened throughout the agricultural sector throughout the you know, ages, of course, because you know, mutuals and cooperatives have been used by farmers in, you know, over time to aggregate market power before. And so what it does is by aggregating market power and negotiating with a single voice, it brings these brokers down so that, so, so that they deliver, they have to, to work at, at, at a better, you know, to deliver better results for farmers effectively. So in this way, we're hoping to drive efficiencies in the transaction process and the costs and ultimately to, you know, to enable farmers to retain more value so that we can incentivize farmers at scale to, to deliver those impacts. Um, it's, it's, it's beyond the, the, the price though. It's also, uh, as Woody was referring to, um, the, the idea that if you can bring farmers together and create a vehicle that enables uh, farmers to negotiate in, with a single voice, we can then start opening up those other opportunities beyond, beyond carbon. And really interestingly, things like um, whether it's carbonates, um, ISO, uh, food score, or the, uh, sorry, or food certification, or uh, Ag Forces, Ag Care, whole of farm methodology, and or, or um, for that matter, accounting for nature. What we can do is we can start enabling the likes of Coles or Woolies to actually look to what they're really interested in. They're not really interested in carbon. They're really interested in sustainable farming practices. And if we can find a way to capture that and enable farmers to present a like a a, um, a, a single transaction, if you like, a, a transaction at scale to to, so to someone like Woolies saying hey, if you, you can invest here, you can buy a whole of farm kind of outcome. That, that, that is what, you know, as we, based on our conversations, that's where, where the, the likes of the retailers are much more interested than, you know, just simply buying carbon. So that's, that's, that's our idea that markets are looking to move beyond carbon. They're looking to go for, um, to deliver environmental outcomes and those environmental outcomes, they want to be relevant to their consumers. Um, the, the, what, another thing that we've discovered that in terms of if farmers can work out a way to work collaboratively, that delivers um, uh, stronger outcomes to, um, to you know, uh, is likely to deliver stronger outcomes with respect to compliance and conservation outcomes. And so that's the idea of the difference between, you know, uh, a regulatory stick versus an incentive-based peer-based mechanism. And so, for example, one of the discoveries we, we made through our co-design process was there's an opportunity for, if farmers come together in a local area, as Wardy was describing, to create that regional impact, they can enter into a single, um, a single transaction that's open, that, that incentivizes other farmers to join over time, but um, also provides a way that they, um, there's a peer-based um, kind of incentive and motivation structure so that um, if someone uh, isn't meeting the, 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 what's required under the transaction, there's mechanisms whereby the, the, the group can, can help to bring that, 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 that um, dysfunctioning bit um, into line. So ultimately what all this means is that like, um, what we're talking about here is in terms of environmental markets goes way beyond the idea of carbon. It's um, delivering improved biodiversity. It's delivering you know, climate resi resilience through a range of, you know, through flood mitigation, for example. And um, 
and that like uh, delivering uh, protected species um, you know, uh, uh, outcomes is something that, um, that can be achieved through, through these types of localized environmental uh, transactions. So it's, it can be an income source, it can enable a product a differentiation through that green provenance. Um, and ultimately we need to be able to kind of, uh, to, to be able to leverage the data that's being used to support these environmental transactions in ways that like benefit um, farmers. So where to start? Um, one of the departure points that we've arrived at is the idea that, or the understanding that um, we need to have a, a kind of a standardized way to assist farmers to get a sense of what the environmental opportunities on their farm. So you need to be able, as a farmer, you need to be able to look at their, your, your farm and go, this is the, these are the ways I can benefit from, from environmental markets. And in order to do that, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's how do you measure it? How, what, what, what is the data that drives it? And so we've been working on a project that uh, looks to, um, it's bringing um, a few different entities together, uh, accounting for nature, um, AgForce, uh, Carbonate, um, and, and some, some others, uh, the, car, uh, carbon, the Carbon Farming Foundation. The idea is that by bringing, um, by using that mutual structure where, where people understand it's non-competitive, it's collaborative by its, by, by, by its construction, we can bring entities together to kind of work together to find ways where we can efficiently collect, collect data at scale from, for farmers. So like enabling them to driving down the costs of, those, of that data collection and to then use that data in ways that it can be um, delivered and um, deliver value to farmers through a number of different lenses. So, it's, so the objective is ultimately is to enable um, farmers to step into a process whereby that they, they can initially assess data themselves but then by, by uh, leveraging like a, a, um, an aggregated um, structure at scale, they can collect, enable data to be collected and to deliver something that enables them to measure, you know, to be able to visualize what the environmental value uh, is on their farm. So the thing is, so on the right here is like an imagine, imagination of what a dashboard might look like. I'm sure it'll look better over time, but like the idea is that by, um, by bringing together different um, ways of viewing the environmental value into one dashboard, we can kind of harmonize all these different efforts that are happening across the country, and there's many of them, um, to enable farmers to get a sense of what the, the, the environmental impact and the environmental opportunities are on their farm and within the, the total, you know, the, the local landscape. And by doing that, we can then step towards enabling the transactions off the back of that. So whether that's with, with respect to soil carbon, standing carbon, or by, by um, creating, uh, you know, uh, enabling markets with respect to biodiversity, or as you say, those whole of mar those whole of farm type uh, opportunities that, that we can see will be uh, can be opened up through environmental markets over time. So I think that basically takes you on a bit of a potted journey through through our thinking about the environmental markets. Um, so I thought we'd bring you back to this point here because the in a sense the departure point for us is how do we enable collaboration to occur at scale through environmental markets to, to, to achieve what we want to achieve through environmental markets. So how do we enable that collaboration at scale? We need to find ways to bring uh, groups together in that local or regional kind of catchment area that, that Wadi was speaking to. And one, so, so the thinking is, and we're, we're working with uh, Landcare New South Wales and Landcare Victoria and AgForce in Queensland to, to reach out to their member bases and try and find a way to communicate with them and about the environmental opportunities on the farm and then talk them to, to get them arrive at a place where if we can kind of find those farmers that are the, the early adopters, the, the motivated, um, those motivated to understand the impacts that can occur in their local region and find a way to bring them together, then we, be, then we have something that we can build upon to, to, to kind of expand upon those, you know, those pilot projects so we can understand, you know, what the opportunities might be in Wimmera versus what they might be in, you know, in Lismore. And so that's the idea behind this, this uh, uh, using this platform, is suggesting that um, if we can uh, have farmers who are interested join these local groups, then that's the first step. And there's no, there's no cost to that, there's, um, but that's the idea behind it. Woody, is that... Uh, 
That's great, Matt. Thank you. I think All if right. everybody feels that they can whilst we're answering these questions, join a group, uh, just go to the Regen Farmers Mutual Control Shift and find your group. Type in your postcode or your town, see who the nearest NRM region is, and uh, you'll be starting down the path. Peter, a few questions I've noticed have come yeah, in. No, well, I'll, I'll um, handle those. So I'd just like to say before we go on to questions, that was very enlightening. Um, and also I've put up in the chat um, box, the uh, web address for our next um, webinar, which I'm hoping you will be delivering on the 14th of, Feb uh, of August at the same time. And it deals with more in detail um, uh, understanding of where we what we're talking about today. So we'll we'll send out emails to everybody that's um, interested in that on the twelfth of August. Uh, and just, so just keep your eye out. And we haven't quite got the uh, final website working today, but it will be working shortly. Uh, now for questions, I've got quite a few actually, but so we'll start at the top. <clears throat> Andrew, this comes from Peter Todd, New South Wales. As you see, EG and S brokers are as a problem. How should it be done linking buyers to the farming sellers of EGS? Uh, if, it, if it wasn't clear, Peter, I think that they should be representing themselves through a farmer owned brokerage uh, that can take the farmers in a landscape and work with them to define environmental goods and services that they collectively manage through their farming practices. And unlike the sort of top-down market where you comply with the regime and you get rewarded with offsets, here you're acting like a functional market where both supply and demand can bring things to the table. And in this case, farmers bring a supply of environmental goods and services to the demand and say, this is what we've got to do Oh, this is what we've got to offer. These are the things we're going to do, the actions that should result in these outcomes. And this is how they'll be measured. Is this a transaction you want to participate in? So I, I view it as very different to the current system and being farmer-led, farmer-centric. Um, <clears throat> now I have a question from Michelle Smith. Uh, could could you explain the relationship between increasing soil water holding capacity, floodplain harvesting and water rights? Three very interesting things. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that the relationship is uh, causal though. So you increase uh, your water holding capacity at a molecular chemical level when you increase the organic matter within your soils. So that means that water with a greater oh, soil with a greater water holding capacity is you know greater drought resilience but ultimately your water holding capacity fills in a rainfall event and then rainfall continues down into floodplain harvestable areas now whether that should be allowed to flow for environmental reasons or there is a right to the farmers who are seeing that water flow across their property to harvest it is, um, is a contentious issue. Not one that I've got a, 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 a dog in the race on, um, but yeah, I guess there will be environmental concerns about people taking so much water, plain harvesting, that there's none for environmental flows and I don't know where the balance is, but uh, I do know that it's incentivized perversely at the moment so that there can't be a, because of this top down market that we find the water market in, there can't be a sensible conversation between irrigators, uh, conservationists, the environment and the market. It, it's too structured and oppositional at the moment. Okay, um, now before I lose a couple of questions, in the chat box. Um, how does this all interact with the Australian Agricultural Sustainability Framework? Do you have a, any idea about that? Uh, is that the one being done by the NFF? 
I'm pretty sure it's the one that's coming out of um, Little Proud's office in the NFF, yeah. Yeah, so we've been in liaison with the NFF, uh, Andrea Kosh and Oscar Pierce helped us with co-design uh, course of, uh, you know, initially with farmers uh, back in August last year. Uh, they're looking for a sustainability framework uh, to act as like a an industry-wide, industry agnostic framework to promote biodiversity. But they're not necessarily engaged, as far as I know, in how you take measurable environmental improvement to market. They, they haven't worked out that. Um, and, and so they see that the role of a farmer-owned broker or mutual would be quite beneficial to both their objectives around the framework and to farmers on the ground. Yeah. So. Okay. So we'll keep that'll be a work in progress, I guess. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, from Bimberdeen, Bob Bob Davy has got a question. The price of carbon is over hundred dollars in Switzerland, Sweden, and others. The average price in Australia is fourteen dollars and thirty-five cents over 12 ERF options. Why is this so? And he's also got a statement, our highest carbon paddock is 235 tonnes of soil organic carbon per hectare. And this is done by cattle grazing and management. So I guess it's a question about the difference in price and maybe what the implications of that are. Rowan, do you want to take that? Sure, sure. In terms of the, the, the price, um, so, in Europe, the, the the voluntary market is is alive and well and and, and growing, and, and the carbon price is going up to reflect the um, the demand and supply balance there. Um, in Australia, the the ERF, of course, is you know it's Commonwealth government um, sanctioned, so they set the price um, and um, and ask. It's kind of a reverse auction process, you know. So, as the Buyer, so they buy. There's nine, as I said, 96% of carbon in Australia is actually transacted through the ERF um, currently. They, they're the ones dictating what the price is. So it's not a market price. It's the government going, well, okay, this is what we're prepared to pay. The in terms of the voluntary market in Australia, the there are transactions occurring over $20 a ton, um, where there's and there's some sort of um, and the way that that's been kind of conceived is there's a there's a um, a premium paid for uh, other co-benefits. And so whether that was done through the LRF or through other mechanisms, as in through the voluntary market, but for example, there's in um, there's cultural credits being a kind of a, a attributed to uh, indigenous fire, credit, uh, fire carbon transactions. Does that answer that question in sufficient detail? So it's a difference between a, a, a a market where demand exceeds supply and there is actually transactions occurring and a regulated market locally. Okay, yeah. Yep. So we need to get to a, an open market. Um, uh, Peter Todd's got another one here. What is the relation, which is a sort of a common question I would imagine, what is the relationship, the financial relation, relationship between ACUs and EGNS? So, so the ACUs are the, the unit under the ERF. So yes, that's yep. what we just spoke about. EGNS are it's it's a it's an umbrella term for environmental goods and services. So perhaps one way to kind of look at this is, this is in terms of an example. So Wardy spoke about that Bellinger example, where where we're putting together a you know a composite you know, layered transaction where there's some potentially some soil carbon, certainly some biodiversity and some and some flood mitigation. Now in terms of the process to to of price discovery that we're we're um, seeking to undertake there. It's about cost plus in a sense. So the idea is we're going to, um, in, under the pilot, going to a group of farmers to say, what are the actions that will deliver um, flood, these flood mitigation kind of outcomes? So the outcomes that we're seeking, what is the cost to the farmer of undertaking those, whether it's you know, an opportunity cost with respect to some land being you know, put under trees or, or uh, opportunity cost with, uh, with respect to, or, or the actual physical cost of doing, some, doing something. So what is the cost that the, the, the farmer bears? In addition to that, is there any, um, uh, in order to motivate sufficient farmers to, to do this action, is there an, another amount that's required on, you know, on an ongoing basis, for example, with respect to maintaining the, the, that land over time? So the objective here is to go um, understand the cost and then turn around to, to the RTA and say, for, as, as for example, it costs you 
for argument's sake, $4 million a, road, a year per annum to clear the roads. And you've got this, and to repair the roads after the, there's been 12 flood events over a 14 year period in, in that region. So there's significant ongoing costs. So we go to them and go, here's the cost. Here's, um, and so we take up a, a term sheet, an indicative term sheet to RTA. And as the mutual, we're negotiating with them on behalf of buyers saying, well, this is what we want <laughs> in order to be able to deliver these outcomes. If you want these outcomes, that's what, that's what it costs. And we can kind of itemize it. So that's how kind of one way to think about the negotiation process with respect to an EGNS transaction. Very good. Now, yeah, Robert Day would like to know, I guess he might be a dairy farmer by the look of this question. <laughs> would Farmers <laughs> Mutual be open to being taken over as the dairy farmers co op was? So, so, so the, the mutual is a company limited by guarantee. Um, so, is the way it's been set up. Um, the, uh, so, that means that members in aggregate, uh, the farmers control it. So like a dairy co-op might be taken over because uh, if it's a cooperative, if it's still operating as a cooperative, because the members vote to do something. Mm. So ultimately a mutual or co-op delivers value to its members. And if at some point in time, it loses sight of that, and you know, it can happen over time, um, where um, either the business structure, the, you know, the environment changes and the mutual is no longer delivering the member value, or under some circumstances, management of a mutual can kind of lose sight and somehow take the mutual away from its original purpose, which was delivering this value. Now, members always control the mutual because they have the voting rights. So as long as they see that the, value, the mutual can deliver value, they're not gonna actually uh, sell, it, you know, sell it basically. But to the, to the, the moment it stops delivering uh, members in aggregate, you know, in total, mm -hmm. and to, to sell it, it might require 75% of members to vote for a, for, you know, a, a, a proposal at the board, uh, sorry, at the, an AGM to sell it for argument's sake. Um, then as long as, mutual, as long as members see the value uh, being um, maintained, they won't go, you know, members won't vote to sell it basically. Yeah. Okay, now we've got a few practical questions here. Um, Greg Knight would like to know if we can reduce the cost of measuring soil carbon for argument's sake. This is, um, this is underway. The government has identified this uh, and applied federal funding to address this issue. But one of the key ones is around um, the difference between directly measuring and modeling things. So because so few transactions outside of government paid ERF transactions have happened, and even then really hundreds, not thousands of data points have been collected. So you have to do direct measurement to have uh, a confidence in, uh, in the numbers. Over time though, as you get more transactions, you can move from measured to modeled and the deviation of um, uh, standard deviation or the, the variance will be reduced to a level that you can have confidence that in this environment, this soil type with this rainfall, there is this much carbon present. So as we get more examples, you build the data points, you be a, you're you able to more uh, reduce the number of direct measurements to be just verification mem measurements. And then ultimately you get to these statistical models where direct measurements are used just uh, sparingly, and that brings the, the cost of measurement down over time, but it requires data in order to do that. Very good. Um, next question is um, from Kirsty Cooper, environmental policy manager, and I can't read the rest, somebody in Australia. Will farmers need to have ACUs to participate in these processes? Not necessarily. Environmental goods and services can come in all markets and shapes and sizes and um, terminal markets for, uh, that are willing, like supply chains like Louis Dreyfus or Cargill, who want to know the green provenance of the wheat or the, the cotton or the wool. You know, they're going to they're going to um, be less interested in the accus and more interested in the provenance story that uh, that can confirms that the whole of farm system is healthy and sustainable. 
but ACUs still are a big part of the market till to date and globally uh, are a highly regarded um, carbon equivalent. Um, you know, that's why they're more expensive than the Indonesian and Indian ones, but cheaper than the European ones. And the reason they're highly regarded is because they've all been directly measured up to now. So the certainty that the carbon in an ACU has been either offset or drawn down is much higher in relation to the Australian market than the rest of the market. So ACU's big part of the market, highly credible, not used much by farmers. Um, and, you know, they'll have a role going forward, but uh, the other EGNSs will also, or the other ways of expressing EGNS improvement uh, will emerge and, and will take the dominance of ACUs away. Okay. Um, now, a few people have asked this question and I thought you may have answered it with the example about the RTA, but they want to know how you put a value on natural capital. So maybe just run through that again. Do you want me to handle this, Ron, or you? Why don't you talk to the dashboard as opposed to the example before, because that might be an interesting contrast. Yeah, so people will measure the same data differently. And um, so one way in which you can measure the natural capital is through ecological conditions. So accounting for nature does that. There's other ways. So I'm aware Rabo has a client photo where they go and look at um, a property and they look at it through expenditure and, and income lenses and sustainability and animal welfare and energy use and reliance on uh, inputs. And then with that same data, they're able to say, oh, we can index any borrowings that you've got by reducing your loan rates by X amount, saving you X thousand X dollars per thousand dollars that you've borrowed. So natural capital can be valued um, by going on farm or by going through desktop information or through farmer submitted information. And depending on a farmer's unique context, you might be valuing it based on a path to market or based on um, you know, the re reduction in the borrowings across your whole farm enterprise. What uh, I would always recommend is do what is right as a farmer within your context. And what farmers need to do is grab power back so, in, so that they're not just a, the cog filling out the forms, making the processes and regimes and methods work in order to receive a, a government issued ACU. That's not how farmers can get a value on natural capital. That's how they can participate at the bottom of a supply chain. How farmers can actually get a value on their natural capital is get an EGNS farm value assessment, and then you'll get a dashboard back of, you know, what's that do to my borrowing? What's that do to my energy use? What's that do to my labeling potential or management insights? And yeah, where there's an ecological condition described, if I was to take the econ score on my farm at today's market value, you can work out an estimate for um, different elements of natural capital, be it soils or vegetation or fresh water. So uh, one it's like a one-to-one -one fit uh, rather than a one size fits all when it comes to valuing natural capital. All right, well, we're nearly at one, well, we are at one o'clock. Oh. And that was when we were meant to finish, but um, I've got two more questions that I think are worth asking, if that's okay with you guys. Yep. Um, one from Colin Pierce. Uh, is Regen Farmers Mutual open to all farmers engaged in all shades of adapt adoption of sustainable practices? Yes. In fact, you want to have... Um, the idea about mutuals is we will help individual farmers, but we ultimately want to help aggregate farmers in a region. And there's a point where you can open a product where it's economically viable and it reaches a, a transaction scale. But unlike a traditional commodity sale, you don't want to close off that product. You want to keep it open. So it might take 15% of 
farmers in a catchment to open a product, uh, but you want the 16th percent to 95 percent of the other farmers in that catchment joining that product over time, being what we call an open product. And that's consistent with what mutuals do. So if I join a health fund mutual, I can, you know, fill in my health questionnaire, get a premium and, and, and join dental and optical or, you know, accident and emergency products within that health fund. And farmers need to be able to do that when they're ready um, as well. Okay. Um, we might make this the, the last question and hopefully more of this will be covered in detail at the next webinar in a fortnight's time. But um, Michelle Randall of the Cattle Council of Australia would like to know, what are you doing to give producers, producers assurances that they can trust the mutual? Are you going to be signing the CMI Carbon Industry Code of Conduct, for example? I know many producers are wary and confused about these kinds of schemes. So I guess yeah. that's a matter of trust, really. Uh, I mean, I guess we're different to everybody in that Rowan and I didn't set out to become carbon brokers in ethical fields. We were working with 80 farmers over three courses and they co-designed um, what was needed and described their business model and, and described the principles. And then we just took those principles and put them into the constitution of the uh, Regen Farmers Mutual. And so it's been designed ground up by farmers, for farmers, with farmers as the stakeholders. Uh, yes, we do need to sign an, uh, the CMI to be part of the carbon markets. We do need to um, have an AFSL to trade carbon. So we have to do everything that every other broker does uh, to win trust and credibility. And then over and above that, our owners, the people that vote, the people that benefit from the existence of the mutual are farmers. Uh, there's no third party shareholders or investors into the mutual that can change the agenda. So I, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, regardless of the farming industry that a farmer's in, that they would find that of comfort. All right, well, I think that's, um, sort of scratch the surface, if you like. There's, like, there's an awful lot there. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to the other questions. Uh, but if people come along next fortnight and ask them, or if they uh, probably send a, uh, a note to info at farmersforclimateaction.org.au and put their question in before the webinar, we can make sure that we can get a more thorough answer to them. So anyway, um, thank you, Andrew and Rowan. I think that's been really good. Um, and thank you to everybody who's attended and hopefully you've learned something. We will be back again, same time, same channel, two weeks time. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, that's great. Thank, thank you, Peter. You. Bye.